Welcome, everyone. This is early May 2018. David Morgan with you, and this is a special podcast I'm doing on a book I just read. I met this gentleman through my LinkedIn associations, and I was really inspired by what he had to say uh, with me on LinkedIn, but uh, better yet, I got the book. It's Joel Solomon in New York, and the book is called Mindful Money Management, Memoirs of a Hedge Fund Manager. And being in the financial markets for so long, there are so many things in this book, Joel, that I could relate to. And I just kind of want to go through it uh, probably haphazardly. I'll try to stay in some type of order. But let's talk about your early years and you were striving to become a hedge fund manager. So why don't you introduce what, who you are, why you wrote the book in your early years. So there's three questions to start you out. Thanks so much, David. First of all, thanks so much for having me on on the podcast. Really appreciate it. It's, it's a pleasure. And and thanks also for just noting that you were inspired because that, that really touches my heart. I, I appreciate that so much. So to answer your questions, first of all, um, let me just say I'm a dedicated father to two amazing, beautiful, inspiring daughters, uh, Lauren and Morgan, from it from which my company actually is named Salor Moore. And as background, what I'm currently doing, I'm, I'm working as a prosperity coach. Some have called me a money shrink. And my goal is to help at least 100,000 people now become financially free. And I, I work with clients to help identify and overcome their money roadblocks standing in the way of their per, personal financial freedom. No one really talks about what they've learned about regarding money growing up subconsciously between, you know, age, you know, when they were born and it's age 10. And this is sometimes stopping them from taking action. They live in fear. Some people live in fear about investing in different markets. They, they can't invest in real estate or stocks or currencies or commodities because of this fear that they actually have subconsciously. And it creates a poverty consciousness. And so I work with them on overcoming these blocks so that they can move on their way to financial freedom. Now, to tell you a little bit about my career and how I got here, it's, it's unusual, I think, to say the least. And I started my career as an actuary. And some people don't really know exactly what an actuary was. I distinguish an actuary between an actuary and accountant by saying an actuary lo looks at his feet when he talks to you, an accountant looks at your feet. But uh, an actuary does a lot of different things. They'll calculate the reserves for an insurance company for their future claims, or they'll calculate your dividends or your premiums. And I did a lot of those types of things at a company called New York Life Insurance Company. So I worked as an actuary, became a fellow of the Society of Actuaries, going through a series of exams and became a fellow of the Society of Actuaries, but really didn't love my day job. And I had a dream to manage money. And whether it was as a hedge fund manager or a mutual fund manager, that was my dream back in, call it 1993. And everyone I talked to at the time gave me massive doubt. They said, that's impossible. You're an actuary. There's no way you become, can become an investor. But I talked to one actuary who was on Wall Street, and he said, you need to get credit analysis experience if you want to be a great investor in financial securities. And so I made the move to Moody's Investor Service a credit rating agency, got the basics of credit analysis and actually ultimately got a portfolio of companies that I assigned ratings to. And then get, er, learned everything I, I thought I needed to then get to the next level. And a recruiter called and said, do you want to be a private equity investor? And I said, okay, that's one step closer to being a hedge fund manager or, or a mutual fund investor. And so I jumped at that opportunity at a, at a reinsurance company called Swiss Re, first uh, in New York. And I'm working in New York for about a year when my whole group was disbanded. And that actually 
got me the opportunity to work in Zurich. And I, I say in the book, Mindful Money Management, that from bad things come good things, and from terrible, terrible things come awesome, great things. So from this potential bad thing of getting laid off, I got the opportunity to live and work in Zurich for almost a year and a half. And as I say in the book, and I have two appendices on travel because it's one of my biggest passions in life, I got to travel to more than 30 countries, 40 towns across Europe, and really had a great time there. But came back to New York and realized I wasn't one step closer to my dream and started looking, found a job at a small hedge fund, and that got me one step closer to my dream. And ultimately, in January 2008, I, after getting a call from my Citigroup salesperson in late 2007, I started in my dream job, at working as a hedge fund manager at Citigroup and actually managing money. So that's the... Uh, the short story, I guess, of, of how I got to to live, at least for a few years, my dream. And then, I, of course, I started my own company, Solomore uh, Capital, uh, in, 2000 and, in late 2012 using, um, other, uh, it, using insurance company money to invest and, and did that for a few years before I made the transition to become a prosperity coach. Does that answer your question, David? Yeah, yes, it does. You do a lot in the book that has to do with what I call you know, balance. I mean, often in the interviews that I give, I talk about, you know, having enough. And that's a different number for everybody. I mean, ideal, as you have with, uh, like, investment bankers or people that are uh, in the billionaire status. There's, uh, you know, maybe four that I know on a first-name basis. But I don't need that much. You know, I'm very content where I'm at. So when you talk about being financially free in your book, you talk about, I think, three items, and I'm going to lump them together if you don't mind. And that is this idea that, first of all, you got a lot of your foundational, I'll call them philosophy, from others. I mean, you talk about T. Harv Ecker and the the millionaire mindset that he has is, is coaching uh, classes, the one that he gives for free. You talked about Napoleon Hill. You talked about many of the people that have really kind of blazed the trail in balancing. I mean, you talk about Sir John Templeton, you know, and about being grateful. And I know I'm lumping a lot of things together, but I think since you wrote the book, you can kind of summarize. So I'd like you to, to talk about acting as if and – being grateful. I think those two chapters really, really hit hard for me as far as, you know, kind of the path I've gone on as well, although I certainly haven't written a book about it. I learned a great deal from you, by the way. Thank you, David. I really, that, that, I really do appreciate that. So financial freedom, it's a, it's a big topic. And what, what is financial freedom? It, it's, it can be different things to different people, but let me just say how I define it, and and T. Harv Eker and, and people like him define it as the amount of income you get from passive income investments that will cover your expenses, either your current expenses or your dream expenses, your dream life expenses, so that you don't have to work. So let me give you an example. I, this is an example I gave in my book, Mindful Money Management. If you have $5,000 of expenses a month, so $60,000 a year, if you have passive income investments of a million dollars generating 6%, that would be equate to the $60,000 of expenses a year, and then you would be financially free. Now, what are passive income investments? It's not your house. It's not your 401k. It's not your retirement savings. It is investments that are currently generating income for you today. So it could be rental real estate property or commodities or currencies or 
a side business, a Amazon fulfillment business, anything that's generating you income currently, stocks today that you have invested that you can gener you're generating either capital gains or dividends on. So that's how I define financial freedom. And I talked about how I started paying myself first back, you know, probably 25 years ago now, which people, again, it's, a, it's an important concept to put money aside for not for 30 years from now, but for today where you could start investing today and generate income today. So that's an important concept of putting five, what, whatever you can start with. 5%, 10%, uh, and just right off the top, instead of you know, putting it aside for future, putting aside so that you can build up and invest today. So yes, uh, T. Harv did have a fairly strong influence on me, as Napoleon Hill did as well. And John Templeton, you know, he talks about gratitude and, and giving. And it's two, two concepts which I think are very, very important, which no one talks about when they talk about financial freedom. And I think it's absolutely essential to both financial freedom for mindset, for knowing that you're worth dramatically more than where you might be today. And so John Templeton, the quote I have in the book, and I'm going to paraphrase, is, he hadn't met anyone who hadn't given at least 10% of his earnings to charities over a 10-year period who didn't have massively more wealth at the end of the 10 years than at the beginning. So he's advocating a giving program. And, you know, some people may say, well, why, you know, okay, so you're, you're advocating for me to give away money. How does that make me richer? Well, when you give, it kind of primes the brain, it makes you believe and know that you have plenty to spare and share. And that's when your, your mindfulness related to your money mindset changes. And so that, that's the importance of, of giving. Now, being grateful is also really important because I talk about different energy levels, different vibration levels, which... Abraham Hicks talks about, Esther Hicks talks about. And gratitude and appreciation, believe it or not, is the highest energy or vibration or feeling level. If you could feel gratitude all day long, every day, then it's the same level of energy and, and vibration that is equating to love and passion. And so... I recommend, and I started this probably about six years ago, writing down what you're grateful for. So every morning when you wake up, write down what you're grateful for. And it doesn't have to be massive great things. It can be something really simple like it's a sunny day or, you know, I write down every morning I'm grateful for Lorna Morgan. And it's, it just changes your perspective on life. And... I used to, before 2012, right before I go to sleep, think about all the things I had to do the next day, all the things I didn't get quite right in the current day. And then I, in 2012, shifted, and so I started writing down the things that I was grateful for that happened that day. And it's just, it just changes your perspective. Excellent. I'm going to chime in here a little bit. I'm going to circle back a bit also. You know, when I picked up the book and you talked about being of service to others, that's something I was I learned, was taught by one of my mentors early on, and I truly believe that. I mean, you know, when I started my business, it was to be of maximum service to others in an industry that has um, – oh, let's say, been tainted by some of the practices that go on, and it happens in all industries, I know that. And I could, you know, what I believe true capitalism in is, which means that you can serve yourself and serve others at the same time. So if I let people look over my shoulder and see how I do a resource portfolio and how I structure the stop losses, et cetera, 
that I could be serving them, you know, quite well. And of course, anyone that's a sophisticated investor knows that not every stock pick you make wins. But nonetheless, if you obey the rules, you're going to do well. So when you said, you know, being of service, and I'm also right on the same page about being grateful. Uh, this seems, I never heard it expressed the way you did as far as being the highest vibration or one of the highest vibrations. And I believe you're right after listening to you. But I really want you to talk about a little further about how this paradox of giving to receive works or how, let me say specifically how it worked in your life. So you did it and what happened to you? Yeah. So, yeah. So giving, it, it's interesting because again, it, it seems like a paradox, but when the more you give one, it just increases the giving is also increasing the vibration, at least for me it does. And when I, I, I give, I feel like I do have plenty to spare and share, and it, it just it shifts. So I, I, I think I have a chapter in my book called you know, Overcoming Feelings of Lack. And there was a time when I was managing my hedge fund when we didn't have great returns, and I wasn't drawing much income, and I started feeling having that poverty consciousness that I mentioned earlier. And then I started this giving program. And it just shifted. It made me realize, wait a second, there are a lot of people in the world that don't have, you know, don't have anywhere near the, you know, the benefits that I have had in my life. And so it just shifts the way you feel, and then it, things that start changing. And, and it seems like, money starts coming back in and there are so many other things in your life that you're grateful for you 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 can recognize and if you write those down it just shifts the energy and and all of a sudden you start the abundance starts flowing in and and that's what happened to me so that's why i highly recommend the giving program uh you can even start with a small amount. It doesn't have to be big dollar amounts, but it just kind of yeah. shifts it out, shifts the the energy so that you know in your mind that you have plenty to, to spare and share, and then the abundance starts flowing in. So that's, that's how it's worked for me. I'd recommend even in a, you could start with a small amount, a monthly deduction out of your checking account to a charity of your choice, you know, if it's, you know, to cure cancer or heart disease or whatever it is to, to stop poverty in the town in Africa, whatever it is that, that really resonates with you, it, it will change your relationship with money. Very good. Well, one of the other points that I don't think many make or I haven't read a lot about is this idea, and as a youth, I had the idea, you know, that money equals happiness. And, of course, I learned fairly early on that's not true. But you talk, you have a chapter on happiness. You have a chapter on feel good now. And you have a chapter that's titled Trust in Your Gut and Unconditional Happiness. So I'd like to kind of just wrap those up, if you could, in this idea of happiness. because, And, and also, if you could confirm for me that, you know, there's no, if it's money only, then there's no amount that's going to get you there. So if you could just touch that and then move on with your ideas on happiness, I found them very profound. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so again, yeah, money, money doesn't equal happiness, but there is a certain minimal level that is required for the basic freedoms that we enjoy. But I, I talk about happiness a couple of times in the book. As you mentioned, I introduced the concept in Chapter 8. And what happened was I had had a really great first six months in 2013. At my hedge fund, we were up 20% annualized in, in just six months. And in 2014, I realized that when, I wasn't, when things weren't going well, my, my happiness was conditional on if I was making money for my investors. And so if we lost money, I was unhappy. And if we made money, I was happy. And, of course, it's a terrible way to live your life because even the greatest money managers are wrong 
about 50% of the time. So imagine every other day you're going to be unhappy. And I think in general that's what happens in life, that we live our lives on in conditional happiness. So something good happens, you're happy. If something bad happens, you're sad. If you get a raise, you're happy. If you don't, you're sad. If you you know, get that great job, you're happy. If you don't, you're sad. If you, you know, you're driving into Manhattan, you get that great parking spot outside the building you're driving to, you're happy. If not, you're sad. So I realized that I think the big revelation came to me in August of 2015. And what happened was I, it was the first time in my career managing money that I took half the month off. I took two weeks off in August 2015. And that month, the stock market was down about 7%. And the hedge fund that I was managing was up about 3%. And I truly believe it was because I was feeling good now. I was present. I was having a good time, really happy. One, one week, I went to Croatia with my friend Don, uh, who's another investor, and who's actually very calm and wasn't spent, we weren't spending our time you know, checking prices all day, every day. We were actually being present and having a great time in Croatia. And the second week, I was with my daughters going to Hershey Park in Pennsylvania and a few other amusement parks and just being present with them. And I truly believe that, you know, that being happy, being present actually created that great month that I had and it was a revelation for me that I didn't have to stare at the stock screen and and worry about every single tick worry about every single moment that was things that were moving and still do quite well and and that was the revelation for me that when and and I guess I, I make this point in the book and then again it's back to energy and vibration and feeling if you're feeling great if you're feeling absolutely ecstatic and so happy, then what you want, your desires and dreams will come to you. And if you're, it's really hard when you're very depressed and sad to, no matter how hard you work for something, you have a plan, you have a goal, if you're feeling absolutely depressed and anxious and sad and worried and, 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 it's just not going to happen. So I, that's a very important lesson that I, I mentioned in the book is where are you in terms of your happiness level? And if you're ecstatic and really happy, then what you want in life will come. And if you're very depressed and sad, this, it's very unlikely you're going to get what you want. Very good. I want to tie these together. This is my take. It doesn't have to be yours, but I like your thoughts on it. So when you're in that place, and I think we all get there if we're honest, you're down, you're depressed. Maybe you say, I'm not going to let the market movement affect me, but it does. If you, at that point, catch yourself, be mindful, and you go out and do something for someone else, does that for me, it seems to, to shift. It, it gets me out of myself into the, you know, being of service to someone else, even if it's, you know, helping them in a physical way or giving up or letting them know, hey, I'm moving out. Here's my parking place or some simple task, but just that little extra caring, I'll call it. Have you ever practiced that or found that to be useful? Absolutely, Absolutely. David. That's exactly how it works. And so, like I said earlier, with the feelings of lack, when you're feeling lack, it, it may seem completely contradictory, but give, right? When you're feeling that you don't have enough, give to others. And, and, and it doesn't have to be just about money, right? You can, you can give a smile or a compliment to somebody. You can, you know, give up a parking spot for somebody. You can give a compliment, and it, it's, it's, it, it can be significant. It can, that kind of giving can be absolutely significant and will, will shift your energy and move you up on that scale towards, you know, number one, which is the, the feeling of extreme gratitude and appreciation. And, and feel that, that's, you know, when you feel blessed, 
that's when you know all your dreams and desires can come to you. Excellent. Well, I told you at the beginning I wanted to keep this to about a half an hour, and I know we could go on for an hour and a half, but I'm going to continue here just briefly, uh, and I'll finish off the podcast. First, thank you for coming. On your website, which we'll get to in a minute, I want to bring up one of the quotes that's there. It's also in your book from Napoleon Hill. And, of course, most people are familiar with the Think and Grow Rich, but not his other uh, works. But in this one, you quote him, and it says, If I give one of my dollars in return for one of yours, each of us will have no more than we, he started with. But if I give you a thought in return for one of your thoughts, each of us will have gained a 100% dividend on his investment of time, end quote. Profound. You know, I finish a lot of my uh, lectures about thanking the audience for giving me the most important commodity of all, which is their time. And a lot of people, you know, quote, unquote, waste time or don't manage their time or whatever. So I'd like you to take off on that theme, if you might, for a moment, and then we'll circle back to your website and what you do now and how people can get in touch with you. Yeah, no, I, I Napoleon Hill has a lot of great quotes, and, and thanks for quoting that, because I, I use that a lot, too. And, yes, obviously time is our most precious commodity. It's, it's not money, it's time. And so how you use your time and what you do with it is, is very important. And I appreciate your time today, David. But it's also about you know, the ideas, so the exchange of ideas. So just giving, you know, exchanging money is not as powerful as what we've done today, which is provide being of service to others and providing great ideas to others, which is, as Napoleon Hill says, the greatest dividend. Well, Joel, I can't let you off the hook without asking this question because I have quite a following in the you know natural resource sector and, of course, my macro picture of the economy. You don't address it in the book, but I know you're a smart guy. You manage money. You're quite successful. And I love the fact that you have a perspective on, uh, on wealth that I think many, many need to understand. And I'm very proud to be able to do this interview with you. But my belief system, my worldview is that you know all fiat currencies eventually – you know, we reach their intrinsic value or close to it. And, of course, we've got the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the world. And, of course, if you look at the Federal Reserve's website, it's going to tell you that the 1913 dollar is worth about 97% less is what it was just over 100 years ago. Do you have a macro view that you'd like to share? If you just want to bow out gracefully, I'll let you off the hook. But I am interested because, obviously, you're a New Yorker. You're a money manager at one time. You certainly... You know, you don't get to be good at managing money if you don't see the ebbs and flows in the economy. So what's your big picture view look like? I, I'm not, I will profess not to be a, an expert in, in the macro economy um, up front, but I do have some strong views which haven't come to fruition over the years. But I, I, so l let me back up first of all and talk about beliefs just for a second. And I, this is what I tell my clients, and it's, it's, very, it's essential. So think about your belief level in each investment idea and rank them from 1 to 10 when 1 is massive doubt and 10 is absolute faith, a knowing that it's going to work out. And you should do this for each investment you're already in and each prospective investment. And if you're way down at 1, 2, or 3, you know, where you have massive doubt, then, then don't go investing or get out because it's not going to work. When you have absolute strong belief, you know, 8, 9, or 10, that's when, you know, if, if uh, Bitcoin has gone down, you know, you're, you're, a, you're an advocate of Bitcoin and you have, you've done your research and you're an 8 or 9 or 10, and Bitcoin goes down by 20 or 30 or 40 percent, you're buying more, whereas if you have massive doubt, that's, that's the guy who, you know, in uh, early December when he had bought it at 8000 and it had gone up 25% and then got back down 20% sold before, you know, it peaked at 19000 just three weeks later. So belief le knowing your belief level is really essential. Okay, so having said that, 
I'll talk to you about my views on on fiat currency. And I I guess my view is I if you had told me about the trillions of dollars that the U.S. Uh, that the Fed was going to print, the amount you know the amount of currency and dollars that the Fed was going to print back you know in 2009 and 10, I would have said that interest rates would be dramatically higher over the next years and the value of the dollar would be dramatically lower. And here we are nine years, eight, nine years later and the value of the dollar hasn't depreciated and inflation hasn't gone through the roof. And so you know, I've been wrong for many years. So I'll, I'll, I'll just say that. But that's my view. I, my expectation is that we'll, we will at some point have significantly more inflation and a depreciation of the dollar. Just not sure when, and it hasn't happened yet. Very good. Well, thank you for that. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this up. I'd like you to talk about, you know, your website, Prosperity Coaching, how people can get the book, the fact that you do uh, uh, workshops and other things, and uh, and uh, I'm happy for you. I mean, I, I wish everyone on the planet was doing what they wanted, but uh, so many people just drag themselves to it from work, and, you know, it takes that, uh, that desire, I would say, to, you know, either be fed up uh, to, you got to you know leave this job and, and do something that you want, or you just are so motivated like you were. You were going to get to be a fund manager one way or another. Even starting as an actuary, you just knew what your goal was, and there's no direct path a lot of times to get where you really want to be. And I think I'm belaboring this a bit, Joel, but. You know, a lot of success comes after a pile of failures, you know, and I think a lot of people that look at you, look at me or whoever, I don't want to make this about us so much, but people that are quote unquote successful in their chosen field and are doing what they want. It's like they just decided one day to do it or they got a lucky break or someone, you know, they inherited money to start their business or whatever. And almost always that's false. Usually it's you learned what not to do a few times before you actually succeeded. Absolutely, it's, you know, you 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 see the the people become popular after they're very successful, and no one talks about the backstory. And there's a backstory for everyone. And there's the backstory is the the challenges and the learnings that they had before they got to be massively successful. So that that's absolutely true. So my to, to answer your question, so the website is salamore.com. That's S-A-L-A-U-R-M-O-R.com. You can also go to joelsolomon.com, J-O-E-L-S-A-L-O-M-O-N.com. And uh, if everyone, anybody who wants to sign up for one hour free of prosperity coaching, you can go on to that website, get one hour free. I give everybody in the world one hour free, so do that. And then, you know, you can get my book uh, on my website. You can, uh, Mindful Money Management, Memoirs of a Hedge Fund Manager, it's uh, discounted on my website. Um, and, you know, there's a ton of free stuff on my website as well. I have, besides the quotes that you've mentioned, which are, I think are quite inspiring, there's free audio files, which are self-talk audio files that I've given out to the world. I also have, which is I think quite unusual, my monthly investment letters from the three years I was managing a hedge fund. I have those on the website for free. And then I also have what may be quite unusual. I have suggested book readings. I have my favorite songs. I have my favorite travel destinations. So there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff. Go on there and you can get a lot of free stuff. And then just uh, quickly on my prosperity coaching, there's three different modules that I, that I teach people on. One is the basics of investing. So if you want to know about stocks or bonds or mutual funds or ETFs or currencies or commodities I can, or real estate, I can go into the basics of each of those topics. The second topic is what tends to be the most interesting. We talk about how to create your dreams and desires 
how to use these affirmations, these self-talks to get to your your goals and your dreams and desires. And then the last is the last module is a bit of what we've already talked about, the financial freedom. And what's your financial freedom number and how you can shift your cash flow, do some budgeting, shift your savings to get to your financial freedom number. Excellent. Well, Joe, Joel, I've had a great half an hour with you. I wish you all the best. I think you are one of the leaders. I mean, there's a lot of leaders out there, but I think there's a shift that's coming, especially with uh, the millennials. I have a 24 and a 23 year old daughter and their whole attitude toward money, I think, is different than mine was at that age. They're more about experience, I think, than I was. They're more about um, the intangible, the feelings. Of course, they're girls, and I think there's definitely a difference. But the point I'm making is that this shift that's taking place about our world and all of the problems that we haven't discussed and I don't want to, but the positive ideas that you do have a lot of control, you can manage money, you can be successful, you can be grateful, you can give. All these things that we talked about over the last half an hour have a profound impact on you, the individual. And I think this is important because most people seem to be lost in this blur of no self-identity, no self-realization, and no actual accounting to themselves what they are required to do. It's not something you can just sit down and meditate for 10 minutes and all of a sudden you're in a blissful state from that point on. It doesn't work that way. Uh, if you'd just like to add on to that, because I think this is a message that is being missed, at least that's how I see it. If you could comment on that, and we'll wrap it up, Joel. I certainly uh, appreciate your time as well. Absolutely. I, I'm in a complete agreement. And again, life is about, you know, I mean, one of my mentors is, is Mike Dooley, and he says the meaning of life is to live it, right? Just be present and live it and, and be in the moment. And I, I'm, I'm a little bit different, but maybe fairly consistent. I, you know, me, my view is, is the meaning of life needs to be happy. To be, to be joyous and 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 it's all about the experiences and I'm I'm probably consistent with your daughters and I, I I'm believing that my daughters will be the same way in 10 years when they're your daughter's age is it's all about you know in enjoying the experience rather than you know accumulating material possessions because as they say you can't take it with you right so enjoy experiences of life and I think you'll be a a better person for it. Joel, I wish you the very best from this day forward. I really appreciated your time. I hope that uh, this resonates with a lot of our listeners, and I'm certain that uh, after some time I'll probably come back and uh, do another podcast with you. Thanks so much for your time, David. I really do appreciate it. Great to talk with you today.